Okay, so welcome, huge welcome everybody. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm uh, Rosalind Smith. I'm the director of the UCL Great Ormond Street Institute of Child Health. And as I say often on these occasions, this is one of the most enjoyable aspects of my role is being able to host these wonderful uh, inaugural lecture symposia. But of course, during COVID, we weren't able to celebrate the achievements of our new professors um, because we weren't able to come together like this. And uh, so we have been doing quite a lot of catching up and it's been very successful having a series of three lectures in an afternoon. Uh, a bit of a challenge uh, sometimes technically, but it's all gone very well. And I think this is the fourth of our inaugural lecture symposia. I want to say a big shout out for those who are joining us virtually and very grateful indeed to our technical support team because I'm told that the experience of those uh, sitting uh, outside the Institute watching this is pretty much as good as it is in the lecture theatre, which is great, but you don't get the tea or coffee. Um, so, uh, you know, this is, this is such a fantastic achievement. And we're, today we're celebrating the achievements of three new professors. So professor, well, they're not that new, as I've explained, but um, we're celebrating them nonetheless. So Stephen Marks, Rukshana Shroff and David Long. Uh, and Stephen's from our Department of Infection, Inflammation and Immunity, and Rukshana and David are from our Department of Developmental Biology and Cancer. And I particularly want to welcome uh, the friends and family of Stephen, Rukshana and David uh, to come and join us today for this very special day in their careers. So the aim of this afternoon is to give all of you a flavor for what it means to be a UCL professor. And I'm going to invite each of our inaugural lecturers to give us a presentation of their work, set out their stall, uh, and of what each has achieved, because the journey really is the important bit, um, but also what, uh, what the plans are for the future, which is the exciting forward-looking bit. So just to give you some idea of the running order, um, after my introduction, I'm going to, my general introduction, I'm going to introduce Stephen. He will then deliver his lecture, and then we um, ask uh, Professor Mike Dillon uh, from this institute to give a vote of thanks. We don't uh, expect our inaugural lecturers to answer questions. So when, uh, when Mike is finished, we then move uh, through into Rakshana's lecture. Uh, and Rakshana's vote of thanks will also be uh, provided by Mike Dillon. And then at 16.40, uh, I'm sure we'll be on time, uh, we're going to convene for tea on the balcony um, and then return back into the lecture theatre at five o'clock when I'll introduce David Long. And David's vote of thanks will be given by Professor Adrian Wolfe, who uh, is formerly from UCL and from this institute and is now chair in paediatric science at the University of Manchester. And after David's lecture and vote of thanks, I will invite you to join us all for some uh, refreshments on the balcony and in the winter garden. I think in the winter garden, actually, downstairs. Um, but what I want to say before we um, go into the main part of the programme is that this afternoon's symposia has a very bittersweet element to it. All three of our inaugural lecturers work in paediatric kidney disease, and each of their careers has been greatly influenced by the mentoring support of one Professor Leslie Rees, professor at this institute and a paediatric nephrologist, who sadly died uh, after uh, an illness uh, on the 23rd of May, and her funeral was yesterday. Leslie's death leaves a huge gap in this inaugural symposium, but we know that she would have wished us to continue in the way that we had always planned to do, and that's what we're going to do. And later um, in the year, we're going to have an opportunity in this lecture theatre to honour Leslie's life and her outstanding contributions to child health. So... Okay, <laughs> recording in progress. 
So, let me begin with Professor Stephen Marks. I like to <laughs> make eye contact when I uh, introduce my colleagues. So, Stephen was born and brought up in Scotland, where he qualified in medicine from Glasgow University in 1993. His clinical training took him to a lot of places, Newcastle in the UK, Australia and Toronto, and he arrived at Great Roman Street in 1997, where he became intrigued by the clinical and research challenges of paediatric nephrology and undertook, first of all, an MSc, awarded with distinction, and then an MD. Stephen's research interests include systemic lupus erythematosus and the uh, renal complications, uh, vascular disease, and kidney transplantation. Stephen is also director of the NIHR Clinical Research Facility at GOSH and theme lead for patient and public involvement at the NIHR uh, GOSH Biomedical Research Centre. Stephen's also a very enthusiastic educationalist and teaches on many local, national and international courses. And it's very important to note that your considerable academic achievements, Stephen, have been made whilst delivering a very busy full-time clinical service as an NHS consultant. And as a paediatrician, I know that the people who are always in, in the middle of the night, are the paediatric nephrologists. So, um, I, uh, as you know, those of you who are regular attendees, I like to uh, gain some insights into perhaps the extracurricular activities of our, um, of our new professors. So, uh, of course, I never disclose my sources, um, but I did seek some input from Stephen's colleagues, uh, which came in a series of bullet points, which I shall read to you. Some of them are a little cryptic, so make of them what you will. Uh, first, to know all the gossip, brackets, almost a competition. <laughs> Friend to everyone. Uh, must drive his wife mad as he's always online answering his emails even when he's on holiday. I'm sure nobody else in the room is like that. <laughs> uh, first on the dance floor and always the last off. Uh, and a lightweight when it comes to alcohol. Not a bad thing. Um, <laughs> So I got to know Stephen early in my arrival at GOSH ICH, when in my first few weeks I joined uh, a joint clinical and academic seminar uh, focused on paediatric kidney disease chaired by Leslie Rees. Uh, and in my experience, Stephen's always upbeat and cheerful and a real source of inspiration to those around him. So, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Professor Stephen Marks, Professor of Paediatric Nephrology and Transplantation at the UCL Great Ormond Street Institute of Child Health in delivering his inaugural lecture as a UCL professor, which is entitled, The Formula for Success Equals LDT to the Power Five. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Rose, for the wonderful introduction and uh, your very kind comments. And I'm going to get those people that gave her those little insights. Anyway, um, it's a great honour and privilege and also to welcome everybody on Zoom as well to be here and um, to deliver this lecture. And I wanted to give you a little bit of an insight into my kind of crazy brain that you're about to see. And um, as Rose said, and it is, the formula for success is LDT to the power five. So I went to my friends who have uni university professors and I said, what is it you're supposed to do? And here we are, and I'm so honored to be sharing this uh, stage today with my colleagues, Rukshan and David, that I've collaborated and worked with over the years. So the first place I went was I thought I should check with Professor Trump because it's really important that I set the scene. The kidney has a very special place in the heart. It's an incredible thing. It's incredible. Um, okay, maybe we won't. Okay, we've had enough. So I then thought, how do I grab your attention forever? And I, I was told you've got to use lots of slides with lots of statistics to really fool people. And here you can see Professor Trump's um, lies 
which seemingly, I mean, they've just exponentially increased. So I thought to keep you on your toes, I would put in a few mistruths and see which one of you are able to catch me out before the end of the talk. So when I was thinking about what I was going to do today, I was thinking about the fact of the journey, as Ros said, and actually getting here. And it really is a journey that many of us have taken over the years. And I think it's really important to think about those that take you on the journey. And for me, actually, delivering this lecture is, is everything that it shouldn't be, because it's not about me. Everything is about the team and the people that you meet and you collaborate with that meet you both clinically and in research along, along the years. And that's really what I think is a really important thing to focus on today. And as a clinician and a researcher, as Ros said, with my CRF role and leading the transplant program, um, I really am embodied in trying to improve the quality of the lives of children and young people by going out, asking questions and coming back with hopefully the answers which will change their lives. So what is the formula for success? Well, I think you think about your career um, but actually, very often, it's not just about your dreams, your visions, your goals, and what you do. It's actually sometimes serendipity. And I'm going to touch upon some of the things that happened to me along this uh, long journey and hopefully bring it all together. And I think the important thing is, is that you to get where you want to get to, you have to keep on trying. Something doesn't work, go back and redo it again. And hopefully then, and the lesson to my wonderful um, children who are in the audience, to see that you can get the success. But when you get there, this isn't success. This is just the start, hopefully, of the rest of the journey of my career. And it's the persistence, the luck, and ambitious that maybe might give you the success in the end. But really, it is everything coming together. And I think the teamwork, the coaching, the mentoring that Ross touched upon really is important. And I hope that I've learned from those mentors that I'm going to talk to you about, about how I brought and delivered that moving forward. So I'm going to share with you some quotations. So I see now that the circumstances of one's birth are irrelevant. It's what you do with the gift of life that determines who you are. And I think that's a very important lesson. And OK, maybe sometimes my authorities aren't the greatest, but I think it's important that I, I work with children, so I think watching Pokemon movies is also quite important. Now, this is definitely not the photograph of success. I was told you had to really embarrass yourself, and unfortunately, my mother gave me far too many photos, which really would embarrass me. So this is definitely not the picture of how you get to a success. So the first problem is that I look quite young. So I've really had the problem in my medical career that I don't believe that man's ever been to medical school. Can anyone tell me where the quotation's from? It's actually from Toy Story. Um, again, it really applies to me, but as my children remind me, I'm getting a bit gray. So either becoming gray or losing your hair is a sign that you're probably ready to become um, a professor. Unless, I, should I start dying it? No, my kids are saying definitely not. So let me talk to you a little bit about the geographical journey that I got, uh, which of course is always interesting when you look at individual persons. So as Ros said, I started up in Scotland. Uh, my first ever job actually um, was working with children. And I did that job for six months before I had, had any adult experience as a qualified doctor in the sick kids in Glasgow, because I actually felt I couldn't cope with children being unwell. I thought seeing children being unwell and how would you actually physically deal with them? But actually I then got a taste when I did adult medicine of doing some adult nephrology and that sparked the interest which I think grew throughout my career. And I wanted to share with you some of the lessons through time to show you that sometimes we don't learn. And I think with history, we need to go back and learn. So in 1993, you can see here that we've got the same problems with fuel bills. We've got economic recovery being a problem. And actually the waiting lists in the Department of Health showing that they'd reached a million for the first time ever. And look where we are now in 2022, nearly 30 years later. So I didn't travel very far initially I went to Newcastle where I did my formidable training and um, I remember going to the interview as an outsider who's this Scotsman this wee boy as um, my family might say to me 
trying to budge in, but actually it was a great place to train. And I actually had my first experience um, of transplantation, uh, working in a cardiac transplant unit, uh, which really was, again, one of the sparks of my interest, both clinically and research-wise, which I will talk about later on. And um, just to show you that you can see here that actually we've got issues of uh, European Union and Sweden, Austria and Finland being admitted at, at the time. So I decided that common training had come in, I'd have to go to the other ends of the world. So I, I wanted to learn how to dive. So I actually went to Australia. And instead of showing you these photographs of what the beautiful hospitals look like now, I thought I'd show you what they looked like at the time. Um, and this is the matter where actually Peter Steer, who was the medical director, gave me the job in um, Australia and ended up actually coming here and being the medical director of Great Ormond Street Hospital um, more recently before returning back to Australia. And here we had, when I was away, that um, the Duke and Duchess of York got divorced, as did the Prince and Prince of Wales, but Dolly the Sheep was born, so that was my, my key into uh, genetics of kidney disease. So I came back, as you can see, and the only place I could get a job in London as an outsider who'd never been to London was Great Ormond Street Hospital. Who would have thought? There I was, I won't mention anything because Cyril Chandler's in the audience of the south of the river, having an interview for an hour and a half on the telephone and being told actually, nope, you need to come for an interview. And of course, I didn't have the money or the time uh, to travel back. But anyway, I got taken into the arms of Great Ormond Street Hospital. I'd just come from Australia where we had, uh, I looked after sex tuplets that had survived, so six neonates that had survived uh, all the way into infancy. And then we were just beaten um, by the Americans when they had the first sept tuplets, so seven kids being born. I then went on to do uh, further training in general paediatrics in Northwick Park, and some of the um, colleagues are here, so thank you for joining as well, as those from our medical school and past as well. Really appreciate you being here. And um, we can see here that IT was predominantly improving, and you can see here that Google really forming, which again shows the importance that we've had over time. So when I came back to Great Ormond Street and I decided that I wanted to do a fellowship, I traveled to Toronto. And here it was uh, with uh, my beautiful wife, Susanna. We weren't married at the time, but we uh, went to sick kids together. Um, she was working in adult oncology at the time. And you can see here, unfortunately, just as we arrived, 9-11 happened and really shook us because we were on the red eye flight coming over from Vancouver for an international conference. And uh, we watched like little ants, everybody descend from the high rises in Toronto um, to go back to the suburbs where they lived. And actually here we were in Alan Brown building in the you know, 13th floor watching the world worried what was going to happen. Thankfully, I'd already had a job to come back to um, London. And um, the reason really was for the team that I had met. And I wanted you to start with trying to work out who is important. And it's <laughs> definitely not the professor in the photograph, and it's definitely not the footballer, uh, David Beckham. It's the team, both clinically and research, that has really motivated me to working in this wonderful way. And this gets us to the first LDT. So LDT to the power of five. The first one is the lucky dream team at work. And without the help and support of everybody, um, I couldn't have done it. And some of the faces that you can see here are people who trained me and those people um, who I've trained and have become consultant colleagues. And I will touch upon, um, obviously you can see Rukshan and David and the great influence that we've all had in each other's careers. But it's really been like a family. And I think that's the important thing. And both the clinical married to the research and asking the questions has really been quite imperative. And I put this picture up because we've just moved um, 10 years ago into our new ward where we're really able to, to develop and have high intensity patients uh, around the world. Most patients, when you have a kidney transplant, go to intensive care. And in Great Ormond Street, we've only really ever done it for the smallest and the sickest because we've got such high class standard of uh, nurses that are able to support the work. And here you can see the ups um, and the downs. So this is definitely the ups of the team when we're celebrating um, together all the events that are happening. Definitely the ups with the red arrows when they come to visit. 
And then how do we cope with the downs? Well, very often it's the full team and actually there's nothing helps like socializing and really the pandemic has been really difficult, I think, for teams who have been unable to do the socializing that we so need to do when we offload as well. So this takes me on to more clinical and research work. So this is a four dimensional uh, computer generated um, scanning electron microscopy um, of the glomeruli. So within the kidneys, you have the nephrons, which form the bulk of the work. And I'm sure David uh, will be elaborating more from his science. And what you can see um, is the kidneys really work by being like a sieve. And when the sieve holes get bigger, the protein molecules are released and that can happen even because of acts of inflammation or due to chronic damage. So my first LDT is lupus, one of the loves that I got initially from Professor Mike Dillon, who we hear about, and both the diagnosis and the treatment. And this really has led to our collaboration between nephrology and rheumatology when we were actually acknowledged for a clinical and research excellence as a center of excellence by Lupus United Kingdom. And why is it that this multi-system disorder interests me? Well, really seeing children live a lifelong condition, which is life-threatening and trying to get them through all the flares of their disease is really a, is an honor. And I think that every child is gifted, but they just unwrap their packages at different times. So for our children, our patients, every day is really a test for survival. And we know that the kidney disease is one of the major determinants of the long-term outcomes. So we really influence the drugs that we choose by how um, they present with their kidney involvement. And we know that children are different to adults in that they have more significant um, both blood-related uh, side effects as well as kidney involvement. And one of my key research along the journey has been looking at biomarkers. Now biomarkers are some way that we can see whether we can get a clue to what's happening within the kidney. And really it can be a chemical, it can be physical and biological in nature. And we take this measurement usually as research. And what we're trying to then develop is for example, a point of care test where we can at the bedside predict what's going to happen to that patient in the next day, the next week, the next month, and the next year. But everything we feel is new. And in fact, when you go back into history, we've learned a lot. So this is from the medieval man, and the, this is a first realization about having inflammation within human tissues. And actually one of um, my family holidays, it will probably remember fondly, was when we were in Jersey and we met uh, the medieval medicine with this urine wheel, which was made in 1364. And what it did is it assisted you in the diagnosis and treatment of using an illness by having a circular wheel of looking at what your urine. And that really is one of the keys of my research. So for example, what is it that's in the, the urine that can predict what's happening to the patient? So it all started with uh, Mike Dillon and Vanita Shah is also joining us on Zoom. So good to see you both. Um, so Mike was my mentor when I came here and I learned so much from him. And he was my supervisor for my MSc. And I then had to make a decision about whether I did my PhD with him or whether I went on to do clinical work. And actually we published some seminal work which basically showed that when you've got children who've got lupus, and they don't have any kidney involvement, there are markers and clues that we can look at to see whether they have the development of kidney involvement in the next year. And we showed that we were able to predict which children were going to result in having problems. And together with uh, Pat Wu, who's joined us today as well, and Clarissa Pilkington, um, we ended up trying to validate a tool to look at disease activity and damage in children that have got this inflammatory condition. So lupus is a bit like uh, if you imagine diabetes mellitus type one, where your body produces antibodies, so proteins to try and, and attack your pancreas. And we're in the situation with lupus that it can affect any organ at any time for the whole of the life of that child growing up into an adult. I then went on after doing some more clinical work um, to do my research with uh, Chell Tullis and Neil Sabir, who are here as my supervisors. 
And we looked at these biomarkers as well to try and see, well, let's look at the kidney tissue and then see what we can find within the kidney. And we were able to look at how the disease were classified, how we could work out which children have more severe involvement. And together with this, we were then able to look at different stainings, immunohistochemistry, so see if there were any clues within um, the kidneys that would help us manage the patients longer term. And that then led us, when we'd seen what we could see in the kidney on, under the microscope, is to go back and look at the urine of patients. And again, we saw that we could find a good biomarker that was going to give us information about inflammation and disease activity. And this very often happens before any of the other parameters that we were able to look at. But why do we do it? Well, we do it because we're thinking about what can we have as treatments? And we learn about treatments through history. And obviously you will hear a little bit more just about how much we've advanced in our technology with medicines. And together with um, Paul Brogan, we ended up publishing the first series of using a drug which really revolutionized the treatment of these kids. So these are children who've got severe inflammation and we gave them a, a drug which depletes part of the white cells. And we're able to show here that their disease activity reduced and that immunologically and clinically they got so much better. This has led us recently to actually publish as an international collaboration the fact that this drug is used in a whole armamentarium of conditions for children and throughout the world. And what we showed here was that you can see the, the reduction in the disease activity, the improvement in the kidney function, an improvement in their albumin as their kidneys were leaking less of this protein that I explained to you earlier. And this was seen together with a reduction in all the immunological parameters and an improvement in the complement system and the antibodies, these abnormal proteins. And we saw the same with the improvements in the blood parameters as well with time. Now, interestingly, what we find is that the children actually, they end up losing this ability to deplete cells. So it may last for six months. Some patients, it can be up for two years or further. And we then went on to do some further work and publish this, um, looking at bigger cohorts of patients together with our Liverpool um, collaboration who run the UK GSLE, and they've joined us online on Zoom as well. But it's very exciting because although we've got some drugs, we, there's a lot more that we need to test. And we really are developing new monoclonal antibodies, which hopefully will continue to revolutionize the treatment of these children moving forward. And together with uh, Paul Brogan and Despina, um, who's here and joining us, as well as Nigel Klein, we also looked at biological therapy and improvements in other conditions, so other inflammatory conditions, which has been one of my passions and looking at the vasculitides as well. So it then takes me to Cathy Quinlan, who you can see here, who is joining us on Zoom. Um, she is an associate professor now at the MCRI, so that's the Murdoch Children's Research Institute, where she has her own research team, and actually was my first joint uh, MD student. And uh, what she was looking at was the cardiovascular disease in children. What happens to these children longer term when they grow up into becoming adults? And we basically showed that the traditional risk factors for cardiovascular disease were a lot less um, than we see um, in adults. But we did show structural changes in blood vessels. We showed adaptation. And we showed that the changes that we saw were correlating with the duration of the disease, but also the degree of the kidneys not working properly. And this ongoing work has then led to further collaboration. So this was uh, joining with um, the European uh, Pediatric Rheumatology Network together um, with others from the United Kingdom, but from um, the rest of Europe. And then more recently, we've been involved in an international collaboration um, through Liverpool ourselves and uh, the United States of America, but also internationally. And Michael Beresford is uh, joining us um, online on Zoom from Liverpool. So I will move to my third LDT. So what could that be? Well, it's living donor transplant. So one of my passions, uh, which started at uh, Great Ormond Street, was looking after children and seeing their improvements that can happen with kidney transplantation. 
And then this takes us to, to, I was told I had to embarrass other people. So there's Dick Trumpeter there and you can yeah. see Mike Dillon there. And so this was one of, uh, do you remember? It's all coming back to you now. This was one of our Christmas shows that we put on the ward. Those were the days we were actually allowed to have a drink on the ward, but of course, none of that can happen nowadays in the modern NHS. And really it's about collaborative working with heroes. And um, the first pediatric um, transplant surgeon that we worked with was the sole transplant surgeon at the Royal Free and at Great Ormond Street, Ozzy Fernando. And um, then Jeff Kaufman, Roseanne Lord came um, over. And in fact, now we've got a team of uh, five amazing um, consultant transplant surgeons who really do a stunning job. And together with the Evelina, we are actually the largest kidney transplant program in London in the whole world now. And we couldn't do all this work if it wasn't for the other surgeons. And here you can see them. So many of them vascular transplant surgeons, but also urologists. I've tried to put you all in the alphabetical order, just because I know surgeons can get a bit upset if they're in the wrong place. Um, but I think the important thing to notice, so nobody's noticed the, the mistake. So this is Jodie Whittaker. She's Doctor Who. I mean, where have you all been sitting? And I think it's really important that we actually employed some female anaesthetists to bolster the number of women that we're working with in our team. But actually, there are many unsung heroes. Those uh, uh, radiologists, those doctors that help us look at the scans and images that we have, and also those interventional radiologists that are able for us to do minimally invasive surgery in some of these children. And we couldn't do it without the team. And Derek Roebuck, who's uh, joining us with Claire McLaren uh, from Perth, um, thank you for all your support, as well as all of the GOSH and ICH academic and clinical radiologists as well. So I've really touched upon how together everyone achieves more. So it is very much more of a team. And a real gold standard is trying to give children a transplant before they ever need dialysis. And of course, Les Leslie and Rukshana now who leads the dialysis program will be talking to you about how wonderful dialysis is. But to really improve the children's quality of life, it is to give them a proper transplant. And where at all possible, we try and give it from, um, from one of the parents, if at all possible. Um, we're now able to do dialysis, hospital at home, um, amazing service that we've got clinically and a lot of research happening. But it's really the transplantation which has motivated me and really pushing the barriers of getting organs from smaller infants. So what we call on block kidney transplants, where we take both of the kidneys or looking at donation after brain death and circulatory death. So these are kidneys from non heart beating donors and really our living program has expanded partly due to the wonderful team that we have, but also the increase in the number of altruistic donors being able to remove antibodies. So we're able to proceed with blood group incompatible and HLA incompatible transplant and also paired and pooled exchange. So where have things gone with time? Well, the first corneal transplant, as you can see, was in 1906. And we've come a long way, as you can see, with kidney transplantation in the 50s. And part of this has happened due to the armamentarium of immunosuppressive medication. So these children need to take drugs for the whole of the rest of their life with that kidney to prevent them rejecting it. Their body may one day wake up and say, hey, this kidney does not belong to me. So how has that happened at GOSH? Well, we saw that we were having more patients that um, in the early 2000s that were having heart transplant and they were on medications to improve their immune system, but it was also resulting in the situation and that they were getting chronic kidney disease. And through the years, we've been doing a lot of work, uh, pancreas, liver kidney transplants, considering doing lung retransplantation and kidney transplant, uh, paired donation. And really we started our ABO, so our blood group incompatible program in 2009 in collaboration with the surgeons. And in 2013, um, the first ABO incompatible a transplant with the current atypical hemolytic uremic syndrome together with Yelena, who's one of my colleagues that we published, and then also our first HLA incompatible kidney transplant, uh, now coming up for eight years ago. But we've seen different trends that happen on time, and Lackwell, who's also joined us today, is one of uh, um, MSc students, looked at different trends that we see. We've actually been increasing the number of kidney transplants that have happened in the United Kingdom, and I'll touch upon this a little bit. But I thought I would actually talk a little bit about how does this all fit in? Well, let's look at the timeline. So this is how we've done with transplants. So um, Dick Trumpeter will remember back in the days of the 80s, 
But as you can see here, there's been an increase over the years. But let's see if we can find the um, causal effects. Well, actually, it's more of an association. So this is when I first came. So you can see here, the first time I come, we tripled the number of transplants. I then went away, and what happened? They dipped. And then I came back, and then they went up. So every single time I went away, same thing happened, a repeated thing. I think it's just because I attract lots of work. And really, it's been accumulation of the team, I am the adult living donor team who are also here from Guy's Hospital, um, to do more living donor transplants that last year we did 40, including a combined liver kidney transplant at King's um, College Hospital. But how does this fit in with the timeline? Well, this is where, when I met my wonderful wife. This is when we got married. And little did we know that uh, within a year, I would get a clinical job at Great Ormond Street. Um, and it was the day my maternal grandmother passed away. And I remember my wife coming to visit me. And it was also, Ros, the week before I got shortlisted for a very prestigious uh, research fellowship, which I could have done. And I had to make, in those days, you had to make a decision. What is it you're going to do? And it wasn't until my mentor in Toronto phoned me and says, look, if this is what you want to do, you can still do the academic work and you can still succeed. And um, Dennis Geary was right to this very, very day. But there I was, I was teaching in Dubai in uh, 2008 and uh, my, my wonderful wife phoned me. I changed my flights because I was teaching for Institute of Child Health and UCL. My wife phoned me to say at 22 weeks that she was bleeding. And uh, she spent two weeks in hospital. I obviously came rushing back. Um, she was in hospital for two months and my wonderful daughter was born premature. And when you speak to her, you can see that it's had no effect apart from maybe the way that she talks to her father. Um, <laughs> and then my wonderful middle son uh, joined us. You'll get to meet him later. He's a source of joy and laughter and you'll talk a little bit about him. You've got more to get worried about Rory. And then the cheeky one, Edie, um, came uh, in 2014. And unfortunately she's camping, so she's not here today. So I'll be able to tell you a few stories about her. So, what am I going to take, take home? Well, the cohorts are kings. I've talked about biomarkers, but it's the data that's really important. And I wanted to share with you some of this data, looking at the work that we've done in the UK. So this is collaborative work with Jane Tizard, who's joined us online from Bristol, who's a retired um, um, pediatric nephrologist. And you can see here that we've really made strides in the improvement of outcomes from children over the years. But what we've not done is changed. When you exclude the failures within the first year, you haven't made a change. So doing research and understanding the biomarkers and predicting to make sure that we can make these kidney transplants last longer. And one of the questions which I'll touch upon is the adolescent age group, which are really quite a tricky cohort where the, I think that a lot has been said about non-adherence, but there's developing immune system, which is research that we're doing and wanting to do in the future and get some funding we put in a grant late last night, so hopefully that will work out. So looking at living donor transplantation, it's pretty similar. And um, that you can see that if you exclude the failures, it still doesn't reach statistical significance, but we have made some inroads over the time. And this means that when we look at our overall data, the half-life, so how many kidneys are not working um, in a period of time that you can see afterwards, so the children not requiring uh, to go on Dallas as a retransplantation is heading to about 17 years and 19 years compared with deceased donors. So living donor transplant from your parent is much better. But how do our patients do into adults? Well, four out of five of them will have survived by 25 years if they have a deceased donor, but you can see here it's 86% for living donor transplant. And that transplant survival rate is about a third at 25 years that you can see here. And this means that overall, when we look at the long-term graph survival, that, um, that you can see the cohort changing with time, but the 10-year survival going from 76% to 63% compared with deceased donor, which is why really our team ethos has really been promoting living donation wherever we can. But we know that there are different factors that influence the long-term outcomes of kidney transplantation. We try and predict what those factors might be. And this change that happens means that very often we end up sticking a needle into patients to try and work out what it is that's going on within the kidney. And that obviously 
causes potentially complications to the child and for very often the smaller ones involve a general anaesthetic. So a lot of the work that I've done is trying to work out can we detect things early? So we're going back into looking at seeing by doing protocol biopsies, but actually doing research into the gene profiling, which we've done with international collaboration and try and work out what are good predictive models. And there's lots of biomarkers that we can talk about um, that we've looked at, but I just wanted to home in on a few. Um, so Chris Clark and Iski Gordon, who've joined us. So we ended up together with our adult colleagues looking at the kidneys of our parents that give a transplant and then actually looking at how their other kidney survives after they've gone with the donor nephrectomy. And then we've also looked at this data to see what happens within children and how that can potentially help us predict the future for these kids longer term. Now, UCL has been at the forefront of lots of different research. And one of the areas that we got into was uh, circulating um, uh, cell-free DNA. And this can happen, which was pioneered by Lynn Chitty, who's joined us, uh, looking at fetal DNA, where you can diagnose a child with Down syndrome by taking a blood test from the mother. And we used this technology to try and see if we could see if there were circulating fragments of this DNA in the blood of our children who've had a kidney transplant by seeing if they've developed from their donor. And we did it in a way where we didn't need to know much information about the donor. And together with uh, Jenny Preka, who's joined us in the audience, who's one of my PhD students, we published um, our, our work looking to show that we managed to develop our own in-house and validated new uh, measure to look at the fraction of donor-derived cell-free DNA. And we could get the results within 48 hours. We're also trying to reduce that time at a relatively low cost. And Jenny's gone on to do other work, looking at a European registry, trying to predict, looking at the access to kidney transplantation for our patients and looking at the longer term outcomes that they can have. One of my other um, students who's doing a PhD with me at the moment, together with Jo Ray, who's in the audience as a supervisor. And as you can see, she's at home with uh, Carla as she's currently on maternity leave. And we wanted to look and see what were these barriers to kidney transplantation. And in fact, one of the ones which we wondered whether it really could be modifiable is some of the psychosocial aspects. And this led us to start an atomic project, which is looking at the access to transplantation and the transplantation outcome measures in children. And this is part of an NIHR funded study that we're doing um, nationally. And one of my colleagues who is joining us, uh, he's just uh, off a plane from Heathrow. So he'll be joining us on Zoom, but we'll be getting a drink with him very shortly. Uh, when he did his MSc, we looked at some of the ways that we could predict. And one of the interesting aspects that we found is that they actually children who have a short period of dialysis actually do just as well as those patients who've got who've uh, just been transplanted without requiring dialysis. We also published the first cohort, and this was quite a provocative paper, where we looked at the aspect, is it better to have a kidney from a parent who's not as well matched when you've got a whole algorithm system in the United Kingdom from deceased donor, where we're actually able to get the best matched kidneys. And here you can see that even if you have the, the poorest match, so level three and four match, living donor, you actually, your outcomes are still much better by getting a better match donation after this is a heart beating transplant and it was statistically significant. We also looked at, well, what about you, the calls that we get as uh, Rose says at four in the morning. And uh, these are sometimes where we say, actually, we're not going to take that kidney. And there are some difficult decisions that we make together with the transplant surgeons. And we looked to see what happened to these children and these kidneys. And really, when we did this work, we saw that the decline rate actually reduced. So we are spending a lot more time trying to work out how we can change this. But one of the things that we work with our kids is trying to balance everything every day. So Yelna and Zainab, who work with me in the transplant program together with Sheila, Ellen, Diana, and our pre-transplant Maria um, and Jen, we work all the time trying to look at this balance so that if we give too much immunosuppression, then you get infectious complications. And if you don't get enough, you get rejection. And for those of you um, who know in the audience, Amelia, can you help them out? What's on the left? TikTok, yes. So this is TikTok TAC. 
So this is Tacrolimus, and in the audience uh, we've also got Jude Cope, who's another of my PhD students, together with Joe Standing as the other supervisor, where we're looking at Tacrolimus profiling and using a lot of data from our GOSH clinical systems, using through a research platform, where we're able to try and see whether with some markers that we can actually predict with looking at large data on our individual patients. And one of this has led us to thinking that, well, maybe patients aren't taking their medications. So this developed us uh, having an, an adolescent transplant program and actually working collaboratively. And this is Paul R. Harden, who's also joining us um, today, where after setting up this clinic, we published in the BMJ a decade ago, that actually, if you tailor your treatment for children, then the long-term outcomes work. And it's a relatively intense resource, but a cheap way to make sure that kidneys last longer. And together uh, with the collaboration that we've got with Coventry University, again, another PhD student where we're doing a renew technologies where we're trying to see if we can increase the treatment adherence among adolescents and try and formulate and design recommendations to change things with a digital behavioral change intervention. And when it works, I'm going to use the behavioral change on my own kids, I think, as well. So one of the problems I've told you is you don't take enough um, uh, medications or your immune system's changing. And we've learned a lot in the last 25 years about donor specific antibodies. So this is where your body starts producing these proteins, which potentially can attack your kidney. And we've learned that it can happen in all allografts and there's ways that we can try and predict it. But together with uh, JJ Kim, who also did his MD in London, uh, who's now a consultant um, up in Nottingham, has also joined us. We were the first to institute a natural history study where we showed that if you didn't do anything to these patients and you just monitored them, those that ended up having these donor specific antibodies, they lost their kidneys much quicker, even following up, uh, as you can see here, only for five to seven years. We then wanted immunologically to find out what was happening and we find out that it was because of the complement fixation. So in other words, some kids have antibodies which come and go, some have them for years at a high level and they don't cause any damage and we were able to show the activation of the complement system and we now have drugs that we can use to target that area and again together with two other msc students that i've got um, currently uh, rachel natalie we've looked at uh, immunologically together with thivia sakar who's one of our um, radi um one of our pathologists trying to work out whether these pro-inflammatory inhibitory factors can actually detect what happens and predict the overall outcome for these children. Now, obviously, there's too much in the work to talk about, but I wanted to just mention uh, Yun Yi Hu. So this was uh, another student that we looked at, the national collaboration that's just been published in Pediatric Nephrology, where we looked at really the, these um, blood group incompatible and HLA incompatible transplants, they do really well in comparison. And we're now having an expanding program here in the United Kingdom. And this is one patient who allowed me to use her photograph, um, who was a quaternary referral from Ireland and has now moved on to adults. These children have been told they are untransplantable. And this is what we do at Great Ormond Street, together with our clinical and academic hats, we're able to give these children a normal life and extend their life by retransplanting them or by doing very difficult surgeries. And it's about trying to work with them and see how things go. I couldn't not say anything about uh, COVID and, and the vaccination and how it changed within our program, but also how children did with COVID-19. And you can see here that in our national cohort, like many children, we don't have any symptoms. But many of them ended up in hospital with acute kidney injury and having problems requiring hospitalization. Going full circle back to our surgeons that we started, we're doing a lot of 3D printing. And um, so now we're able, if you go to the Science Museum, you can see our exhibit there. Um, and it really is uh, about trying to plan these complex children with abnormal vasculature, give parents more information. And we're now just putting a grant to NIHR seeing whether we can 3D print the tablets for these children to take instead of them taking multiple tablets that we can actually print them within our own pharmacy together with our ICH colleagues. And this is Pankash, who's one of our um, postdocs who's been involved and we printed some of these 3D models, as I said, that are available. And this is together with Zainab and we showed this off uh, at Great Ormond Street as well. So the future is really to try and work out 
new treatments, get new biomarkers, but precision medicines. And we've got to try and see if we can prevent this long-term damage. But together with Paolo de Coppi, I think we have a lot of work to do in trying to have bioengineered tissues and organs. So somebody once told me, you've got too many interests, Steve. So what did I try and do? I tried to amalgamate them together and actually look at the kidney transplant outcomes for children with lupus nephritis. And this is uh, one of our patients who um, um, ended up um, uh, carrying the torch for the Olympics and another patient who still contacts us. It's lovely to see when they get back to us when they start having their own families. So I'm just going to touch on my fourth LDT, the long dynamic trials. And it's really um, my role as director of the CRF, working with a huge team of people, which is really important, as you can see here, a wonderful leadership with Lorraine and Grant, um, my regular weekly meetings uh, with Vantry and Lucinda, but also all the nurses, Kim, who's last day today, she's retiring together with Tenda and Trish. And really, you can see here that uh, William Van Hoff, who's joining us, um, on, online, um, who has now gone on to lead NIHR. And again, for those of you, you can realize that that's actually William Hurt. He's not a member. He did, uh, he was the doctor in the film, but actually Saul Faust's face has come in there, who kind of with the national, it was a privilege um, with the COVID-19 work that has happened in the vaccine program. And Saul has just been honored with an OBE. And thank you for joining us today. So we do lots of clinical trials. We learn from medications. We try and take it forward. And this is when we end up doing systematic reviews. So we publish 300 pages of how much everything costs and what they do. And then we managed to get, with the first time together with Martin Christian, who I trained with here and Jan Dudley, we published the fact that almost every child with a standard transplant in the United Kingdom is getting very similar treatments. But what we do is we take what happens with the biomedical research center. So for example, our work with primary hyperoxyurea. So lumasarin is a drug which is potentially prevents these children requiring a combined liver kidney transplant. And we're gonna develop with the research hospital um, our infrastructure so that almost every child gets treated as a research patient. But part of my role in the BRC is together um, with PPIE. So this is the first time that the children actually became first authors in a publication, together with my friend, a collaborator from Imperial, who has joined us now as he's been seconded to work in Sydney. So thank you for joining, Jake, where we actually got the children to make soups and to try and see whether we could actually use them as anti-malarials. Sorry, this was us running for um, um, the GOSH uh, race day together. Um, as well. So together we can do too much, so much. We have education and we did it before the pandemic with the European Society of European of Transplantation where we did online teaching. Um, education is really important and uh, we're just about to do the third edition where I'm the lead editor together with Simon Blackburn and Stefan joining us as well. But another benefit for the team approach is does it spread to when things actually go wrong and that's not my thinking at all. I like to work, I like to travel, I like to do the things that are in my head. That's relaxing for me. So that was from Will I Am. <laughs> and the COVID stopped us doing all this traveling. We met, we went quickly onto Zoom. We missed those days when we were all in big rooms meeting and it's brilliant and honor and privilege to be here today to have committee meetings, to have our consensus meetings internationally, but also the socialization at international meetings. I'm not sure what kind of happened here, but it looks like my head's been I said I was going to embarrass myself, but it was also the extracurricular fun that we have when we go to international meetings here. And honestly, I have to tell my wife that uh, it really is very hard work when we're abroad. Um, this is my Mr. Bean impersonation that you can see here. Don't, yeah. And then the person who's got the camera obviously gets far too much to drink, so we'll move swiftly back. So lastly, what could the last LDT be? Well, I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for that lucky dream team at home. So these are my kids. So Amelia said to me when I became a professor, what's the big deal? She wanted to know whether what the advantages were. And then she told me it was probably because you get a student discount, you must get a professor discount. <laughs> then there was my little Edie, who unfortunately is not here today. She said to my wife and I on hol holiday last week, you two can't even handle three children. Out of the words of babes, age seven, but one of my favorites has to be, I know you're a professor, but sometimes you speak nonsense. 
And that was from my wonderful uh, middle son, my middle child, Rory, who said that day after my birthday. And I have ways of dealing with them. It's quite <laughs> simple. So, but my kids laugh because they think I'm crazy. I laugh because they don't know it's hereditary. <laughs> Uh, for those of you, my brother's joining us from America. Can you spot the professor? Well, he got the title just before me. And he always told me that what lies behind you and what lies in front of you hails in comparison to what lies inside you. But of course, I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for my wonderful parents. My late father, who was the first in his family to go to university, became a general practitioner in the east end of Glasgow, very deprived area. And my mother, for her unwavering support over the years, it really made me the man that I am. And I've got my, my some people say I'm the clone of my dad. I've got his, his humility, I hope. Um, but my mum told me that actually very early on, when you just look at that tomato, it looks awfully like, <laughs> looks awfully like a kidney. So for those of you who didn't spot the real big untruth, that's got nothing to do with a kidney. It's some artwork in our house that my wife and I never agree on art. And here is me with my wonderful family. You've met Amelia, that's Rory, that's Edie. Oh, and there's mummy and daddy. That's the ultimate dream team. <laughs> now, as Ross said, really difficult, but leaving to the end. Um, yesterday was Leslie Reese's funeral where I spoke a few words, but Leslie really was the life and soul and inspiration of our unit. And here you can see one of my first pediatric nephrology publications with her, where she told me that sometimes doing nothing is actually the best thing. And Leslie really was um, the backbones of our unit and will be sorely missed. And Rukshan and I talked about whether we should do this today. We know that Leslie, as Ross said, would want us to continue on. But I nominated her here um, as a role model. I just wanted to say and nominate her here that she was an excellent clinician, diagnostician. She really forged me and I wouldn't be here today for the last thing, which is serendipity. It was, I couldn't get a job in London if it wasn't for Leslie, who basically said, well, of course you don't need to come here for an interview. So thank you um, and you will ever be held more dearly in our hearts. And of course, I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for the two of Leslie and Mike, who really spurned my career, both clinically and research. So thank you very much indeed. And of course, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for my family and friends. Thank you. Of course, my wife said, don't embarrass her, but you know, to get her on stage. I don't know whether I need a microphone or whether I'm actually audible without one, but I've got a lot of kit here, which is far <laughs> beyond me, um, unless somebody comes to my rescue. She said well, well done, Steve. Um, what a marvellous inaugural lecture. Uh, you've achieved, uh, as Ros mentioned, academic excellence while a full-time clinician. And I know from personal experience that that is not an easy task. Uh, however, you've managed it uh, brilliantly. Um, I first met you when you, I think 25 years ago, when you had just got off a plane from Brisbane. Um, uh, and I was extremely impressed by your clinical skills. Uh, you were a first rate clinician. Uh, and then you gradually um, showed your colors with that study for your MSc in lupus and then your MD with Chell and Neil Sabir uh, uh, that uh, was also in the same field. But you've made so many great and important contributions that we've heard about. I don't want to bore you with um, repetition. Um, uh, your lecture stands for itself. Um, but I have to say that not only has renal transplantation been your love, but you have spread your wings, lupus being one of them, vasculitis and hypertension being others. 
Um, you've achieved international acclaim for your work. Um, uh, and this has all been fitted in in your role as clinical lead for our pediatric transplant uh, program here. And you've had many, held many important uh, national and international roles. You've raised the staggering figure of 9.5 million pounds in external grant money, which is achievement by any standard. And you, your publication list is so extensive, I gave up looking uh, through PubMed when it got to page 18. Um, I have to say additionally, and this is something I think everybody who knows you would agree, you are a delightful colleague uh, with whom to work. You're kind, you're generous with your time and support, and you're absolutely adored by your patients and probably your staff too, but your patients love you dearly. It's a great advantage doing clinical research, um, controlled trials, if your patients love you because they're willing to participate and undoubtedly want to support you everywhere you go. Um, it's been a great privilege to have played some part in your career and I only hope that I survive long enough to see what more you will achieve. So I'll finish by thanking you and wishing you every success in the future. <laughs>